Hola a todos. Hello, everybody. Great pleasure to welcome you all. Uh, last time it was in Berlin, it was BC before Corona and the world has changed. So yes, this edition of the European Film Forum at the San Sebastian, San Sebastian International Film Festival is placed in the context triggered by COVID-19 and we'll make, um, we will make an in-depth analysis of how the situation is affecting the European audiovisual sector which was already undergoing a process of transformation, obviously, in its business models and structure due to the digital revolution. And we will reflect on the challenges and opportunities faced by the European audiovisual industry. The European Recovery Plan, Next Generation EU, recently approved by the European Commission, will serve as the framework for reflecting on and discussing the actions that institutions and organizations at different levels must introduce to their plans in order to reactivate the audiovisual ecosystem. We have great guests coming up from European institutions, but also from different countries to bring national perspectives to including professionals from the audiovisual industries who are joining us today. The live streaming session is open to the general public. It will be available on the festival website in Spanish and English. That's why I decided to go to English. You can have this uh, translated in the language of your choice. Later, it will be also available in Basque. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about the program of today. It is divided in three parts a presentation regarding the European framework and two panels with rounds of uh, questions for uh, the festival accredited people. The presentation first will start by obviously analyzing the effects of the crisis on the sector and by setting the scene for the new landscape. The first panel will look at further incentives and measures for recovery representatives of audiovisual funding and regularly institutions will present the measures taken during the most critical phase of the pandemic to encourage the creation and the renewal of the European audiovisual industry. The second panel will focus on the transformation that the sector is experiences. That is um, what new funding and distribution models can be consolidated from now on Will this crisis be used to standardize more sustainable practices in line with the green shooting movement? And what new opportunities may emerge after the increase in the consumption of audiovisual contents online? So please make the most of these experts for you here and get ready to ask your questions in the chat when we go to the panel discussions so that you are part of this experience. But that's in for my introduction. Now let me introduce you to our guests for their welcome address. I have the great pleasure to announce first Rochean Munoz Otairi from the Department of Culture and Linguistic Policy Advisor at the Basque Government in Spain. He will speak in Spanish, but remember you will have the Basque on demand on the platform very soon and there is the uh, Spanish translation. Roshan Munoz will take the regional perspective and tell us about the challenges the cultural policy has to deal with in these super uncertain times and the possibilities that the EU gives to the region. Roshan, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. It is an honor to welcome you in this, in this new event here from the Basque Country. We cannot welcome you in our city as we would love to. We cannot meet uh, in person, but well, this is another consequence from, from the situation that we are living in now. But we can, we can see all the opportunities that technology brings uh, bring us. It's the only way to go on, working together and being together in a with technology. If we don't 
take advantage of our European technology, we would waste time. It is very important to improve our audiovisual industry. We have to take advantage of different parameters. We have to take into account different different contexts and with those we will be able to improve and create more industry and reach more different audiences. Creators are more than creators and consumers should be more than people just watching. We all are needed to build an open Europe, a more sustainable world. Culture and creation make us wonder how it could be in the future. We should think about the future. And here in the Basque country, well, we are really a small province of Spain, but our festival and the films that are presented in it show that we are a rich country, we are a bilingual country. We have the Basque or Euskera language and Spanish. We have two windows, Spanish window that opens the door to many, many people and the Basque language that opens the door to another communities. These give us or these bring us more color and we have to face challenges but we chal we face these challenges from the complexity of our region we are small but we know that we cannot work alone we have to collaborate cooperate and from this we have to collaborate with the government of Spain of course with the different European institutions and all European regions to create a common answer to help us. This challenge affects also cultural policies. We have different new concepts that will help us to face the effects of the pandemic. We are creating new measures to reactivate the market, to innovate. Because these have also these have also affected public policies. We have plenty of platforms, and we need to make them available to our population. We have to give access to the consumers so they take part in the industry. We are in the context of the digital era. So we have to implement different measures. We have to adapt everything. So we take into account women also, young people, and all these questions worry us. And we should talk about this and create a debate. Especially in this European framework. Thank you for being here, even though we are virtually present. Thank you for your analysis, and we hope that next year we can see you here in San Sebastián. You will, uh, we will be waiting with open arms. Thank you so much, uh, Rochelle. I, I really want to, to come next year. <laughs> so um, I, I will be there. <laughs> And I will even try to say something in Basque next time. So, <laughs> but now I'm uh, delighted to go on and go to our next guest. And um, well, the budget of the Spanish government for the recovery plan has not been approved yet, but Beatriz Navas, the director of the Institute of Cinematography and the Audiovisual Arts, the ICAA in Spain, is joining us to share her insights on the actual situation. Beatriz, please, the stage is yours again. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's so good to participate in this forum, even online. I would have much preferred to welcome you in person in San Sebastian, where public screenings are going really well with strict safety measures. I will speak in Spanish, but before I want to thank Lucia Recalde and Emmanuel Jolie from Media Program and Jose Luis Rebordinos, director of the uh, festival and Esperanza Luciego, head of the industry program for inviting me and congratulations for this forum. 2020 has been a challenging year and especially for cinema and film festivals greatly affected by the pandemic. We hope that the um, coming year will be the year of the recovery of plans, of discussions, of visions, and we are looking forward to the implementation of the European Recovery Fund, as well as national policies that should help our sector, a uh, crucial sector in the digital culture that we are living on, and to get out of the crisis. And, bueno, ahora tomo la, la palabra. Well, I'm changing into Spanish, Josian has presented different key issues. And as we want to be fast and dynamic, I won't repeat myself. But there are different issues that would be interesting. Firstly, the situation in Spain regarding the um, recovery plan. Also, I would like to highlight the importance of reinforcing our administrations and cooperation between administration and also associations and organizations. We have to work together, and especially, we should, f we should focus and try and look into the future, further into the future. We have to create new uh, transformation plans. And finally, I will just give you some uh, ideas about the mechanisms that we are taking, we are, we are implementing here. When it comes to the recovery plan, well, Spain is one of the most affected countries by the pandemic, and we have, we are also affected by the crisis. So we will benefit from this plan. We will greatly benefit from this plan. This is public information. We will receive 140 million euros and we will have to invest them in three years to transform, well, it will be the, minist the Minister of Di Digital and Transformation that will work with this. So I will give you an idea of the, the things that we have already on the table. I will also talk about the the budget from from our government, but I will not be really specific because we don't have anything conclusive yet. But our, uh, as our cultural ministry has has already said, it will be really important to strengthen cultural industries. We have different sectors, as the audiovisual sector, and we have to give this sector the importance it has. We will tackle this issue from its own particularities But of course, we will we will talk about cohesion, digitalization, 
those key words that are really important. It will be interesting to for, for us because we have conversations with the different autonomous communities, regions here in Spain. And we will take note of everything that will be shared here today in this panel. So we can shape the lines, the strategic lines of actions from the ICAA and the government. We have different laws that have been there for more than 10 years. So we need a bit of a ref refreshment. We have to recover and we have to look into the future. And we have to strengthen the administrations as well. We have to see what have we learned and how the cooperation between administrations can be improved. We should create a model so the regions can be closer to the professionals, to the companies, to facilitate the, the collaboration. In 2019, we created a task force and we are seeing different results now. And this is at a national level, but we have to bring this to the European level to see how these efforts can, Im can have an impact, a bigger impact. And as we are here, Portugal, Spain, and Italian, Ita Italy, sorry. Well, we are really close by, so we have a lot of potential to collaborate together. We should strengthen. We should strengthen our policies individually and then cooperate together because we move at different paces. Different policies have allowed co-productions. For example, a co-production from Spain and uh, the Netherlands. And I think that this should be reinforced and highlighted. We are transforming the audiovisual sector here in Europe. We are leaving the transposition of this sector. So we have to invest at a European level. In Spain, we will uh, we will share uh, the draft of our transposition, so it can be finished in March. We had already adopted some of the measures that are e explained in this transposition. And we also committed to the obligation of investment to um, to different sectors, public and private sectors. But we will change something that is really important. Our operators, those who are out of Spain, that also operate from, from another country into Spain. To sum up different measures that we have approved, Well, we have created different um, eight measures in the ICAA for production. We have created a new one for the exhibition rooms. And we have new aids for short films. So we are trying to 
to make the deadlines and productions more flexible. So people shouldn't people shouldn't suffer from stopping the work because of the pandemic, for example. We have to accompany these companies and pro producers because they are they are doing efforts to create and invent so we have to to give them a good feedback we have a new opportunity for our national production the european production and the spanish production are far from for example north american productions but we have to we have to, you know, take advantage of the situation. We have to implement new aids, new lines of help to reinforce our industry to strengthen it so we can get out of our countries so we can use technology And also we can we can take advantage of this digitalization world, uh, world. We have to study how our consumers are changing. How can we create relations with them? Through a digital environment, so we can have a cohesion in Europe. These are strategic lines that we have to study. For next year, regarding budgeting, we wouldn't like our budget to be affected by the crisis, of course. Um, I would give the floor to the next um, guest so I can I can listen attentively to everything that they are saying. Thank you so much, Beatrice. That was really great for us to see what is the situation from your uh, perspective uh, and there in Spain, what is happening. And now we are indeed going to go to action and uh, let us move on and start into the core of the topic and uh, see now uh, what the key facts are. And we'll start with the data. And um, I'm very glad to have here with us Gilles Fontaine, head of the European Audiovisual Observatory Market Information Department. He joined the observatory in 2015 and as such, I would say, he has an excellent overview about what is happening in the sector. He will now update us about the state of the European audiovisual industry through an analysis of what the latest data suggests about the impact of COVID-19 on our industry. Gilles, please go on with your presentation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I have titled this presentation for today, uh, A Perfect Storm, and please note the, the question mark. Um, a perfect storm, as you know, results for uh, a rare combination of adverse meteorological factors. And I have chosen this title because my point today will be that COVID-19 comes at a time where the audiovisual sector is already engaged in deep transformation and that to an extent COVID-19 is accelerating pre-existing trends and that's what I will try to to show today. Let's start with a, a snapshot of uh, uh, what has happened during the crisis or maybe I should say what is happening during the crisis. Uh, out of the various segments of the sector and I am talking here about the and market, two are obviously severely hurt. Theatrical exploitation on the one side, 
and TV advertising, on the other hand, despite, uh, we must note, strong audiences of linear television. So far, the other segments have shown more resilience. That's the case of the public funding of public service broadcasters. Um, that's due to the relative protection of annual budget. It's true also of pay television, um, thanks to internet and TV bundles. And it's true also to an extent for home video, with on the one side a lockdown of stores, but also the benefits of digital sales and, and rental of uh, films and TV programs. And of course, we know that in turn, uh, subscription VOD kept on growing, which is a phenomenon which, which, to an extent, limited the total losses of the revenues of the sector. But just to give an order of the violence of the situation or of the order of magnitude, the losses of revenues of the sector are very significant, probably around 10 billion euros for 2020 only for the European Union. And this does not take into account the exceptional cost related to shooting or shooting which were relaunched at additional cost. So that's the snapshot of the COVID-19 effect. But as I was saying, uh, COVID-19 comes at a time of transformation. And it comes at a time when the revenues of, of the sector have been stagnating for several years, at least in real terms. So obviously, the, the threat on cinema exploitation is a major disruption. But other impacts uh, that we are seeing now come from trends which were, in my view, already at work. Uh, let's take uh, uh, a few examples of these trends which started before COVID-19. The first example would be the competition between TV advertising and online advertising. Um, it is already a well-known uh, trend that TV advertising is stagnating, whereas online advertising is progressively uh, is um, progressing strongly. And one can wonder if online advertising will not emerge stronger from the crisis than TV ad advertising. Another example of long-lasting trend is the stagnation of the public service broadcasters. Their revenues uh, have been stagnating for several years. A long-term trend also is the decline of home video, which seems uh, unstoppable despite uh, um, the progressive migration of home video from physical home video to digital home video. But still, all revenues from these home video sectors are constantly decreasing. And the, the last example I would like to, to quote is what I would call the transformation of the pay television model. And here figures shows that now the growth is coming almost exclusively from subscription uh, VOD services, even if they still represent a minor share of the market. So that's basically why I am talking about a, a, a perfect storm. A perfect storm would be a situation where most of the segments of the industries are at stakes, cinema, free-to-air television, pay TV to an extent, and home video. I have been talking about the end market, it's time to uh, give a few insights on what would be the impact on film financing of such uh, a perfect storm. I believe it is fair to say that the business model of, of films rely primarily on pre-financing. There are exceptions, of course, but pre-financing is the main business model. And this pre-financing 
is brought mainly by film fund, by distributors, and audiovisual services. So there is a risk that all of the main pre-financers of film face difficulties as regards the level of investment they can invest in films. And it is uncertain whether SVOD, which is the only growing segment among the funders of films, can compensate for the losses of the other uh, financers. So there is therefore, in my view, a structural threat on the pre-financing model of film. In that context, I would like to do two observations. It is likely that direct public funding may become even more important than what it is now. And I recall that in most of the countries, direct public funding is the first source of funding uh, of films. And my second observation is that if the pre-financing model is uh, under threat, it means that secondary revenues, meaning acquisition of rights by services or for countries which were, are not included in the pre-financing plan, are going to become even more important. And I would like to conclude this presentation by open questions. Um, and of course, the first of them is the very future of the COVID-19 crisis itself, the condition in which the cinemas will operate, the condition in which the shooting will be made possible. But I would like also to uh, shed some light on three European que three, three questions. My first question is, can European films gain a higher market share of acquisitions? I have said it before, acquisitions may become more important in a concept, in, in a context where pre-financing is at stake. So can European films gain a higher market share of acquisition and will the new VOD quotas help achieve that goal? And my two other questions relate to the policy or the strategy or the programming strategy of the audiovisual ser services. In a context of limited resources, what will be the trade-off that they will make? What trade-off will they make between acquisitions and productions? And what trade-off will they make between the different genres of content, and in particular, between films and TV content? This was what I wanted to share with you today. Um, I uh, now thank you for your attention and I leave the floor to our moderator. Thank you. Can you see your own music? Sorry, I have to, sorry, I was muted. I will have to repeat myself. I'm really sorry for that. Anyway, I think it was an excellent presentation for us to have all the data at one um, place and to get ready to see and go to the further step of uh, this day, which is now the first panel on incentives and measures for recovery. Um, so what are the tools? We are going to ask the representatives of audiovisual funding and regularly institutions to present us the measures that they have uh, taken, taken during the most critical phase of the pandemic, especially those to encourage the creation and renewal of the fabric of the European audiovisual industry. And for this, I have four guests. Um, I start with Lucia Recalde, head of unit audiovisual industry and media support programs at the European Commission in Brussels. Lucia, nice to see you again after the interview last week for Creative Europe Visions, where it was also about the future. I welcome Louise Shabi, President of the Board of Directors, the EFAD, Agencies of Europe, Director of the Institute of Cinema and Audiovisual, also in Portugal. I welcome Peter Dinges, CEO of the FFA, the German Federal Film Board in Germany, here in Berlin. Peter, wir sind eigentlich uh, Nachbarn. Um, we are neighbors. My office is just 50 meters from you. So we, <laughs> we are basically um, in the same place. Not in San Sebastian, unfortunately. 
And last but not least, I have also uh, on this uh, panel Iole Maria Giannatasio. Um, and research unit coordinator of the Directorate General Cinema e Audiovisivo, MIBACT, which is a Ministry of Cultural Heritage and Activities in Italy. So I would say we have really the uh, great uh, uh, panel here to start with. And I, I'm going to start with you, uh, Lucia, um, with uh, the new situation after the COVID-19 in Europe, which will definitely affect the budget and the implementation of the new Creative Europe Media Programme planned for uh, 21 up to 27. And now taking as reference the framework of the European Next Generation EU Recovery Plan, tell us maybe a little bit more what it is all about and which are the strategic guidelines that uh, you are going to launch at the present time and what will be given priority in the new programme in the short and the medium term. I'll leave you the world for a couple of minutes so that we can have all the basic information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, buenas tardes, Arreta Leon. Land, besides. So I'm, I'm really grateful to take part in this virtual meeting. Uh, allow me to start saying just a few words about what we did from the European Commission in the immediate recovery phase, because the priority was to weather the storm. Uh, Gilles was speaking about the storm. What the first initiatives we took were really, let's try to weather the storm. So we really used the tools we had. We worked on not that many, but certainly Creative Europe to instill as much flexibility as possible to try really to help the beneficiaries uh, adjust. Uh, we uh, managed to allocate 5 million euros for the cinemas for the reasons that Gilles very well explained. Cinemas were closed. And by injecting money liquidity in cinemas, actually it has a spillover effects in the whole value chain. And we also use the grantee facility to try to instill and facilitate the access of liquidity to the small creative SMEs, because we know that liquidity is possibly one of the most important challenges that the industry is facing today. So, and we discussed a lot with the industry uh, because, and with the observatory, to gather data, to all have a collective picture of what was going on, because that could help us tell, take well-informed decisions. And I'm really good, glad, and I think that this work of seamless discussions with the industry, I think, is paying off. It's paying off because in the context of the next generation Europe, this unprecedented effort of 750 mil billion euros uh, 14 uh, industrial ecosystems were considered as particularly vital for the recovery of the uh, European economy. And, and the creative industries were among these 14 industrial ecosystems that were uh, singled out and highlighted. So now, when it comes to uh, the use of the next generation Europe, the guidelines were adopted last week. And the Commission has made it blatantly clear that the money is not just to weather the storm is to really uh, for the transformation, for the transformation of the European economy and the European society. So I think this offers really a wonderful opportunity, really to help the industry reinvent itself and really be able to thrive in, in the years to come. For next generation, Europe member states are in the driving seat. They need to present plans. The commission will be assessing those plans but fair and foremost are the member states that will need to really uh, include audiovisual and creative industries and one as one important sector or for financing. Uh, so I'm really glad to, to hear uh, from Beatriz and from the Spanish authorities that it seems uh, unprudent that uh, this is likely to be the case, at least uh, in the Spanish case. And, Besides, uh, through the other MFF uh, multi-annual financial framework funding programs of the European Union, we will also contribute, we will provide response. Creative Europe and the media program in particular will contribute, uh, that goes without saying, but we would really like to mobilize InvestEU to facilitate investments, uh, equity and debt financing of, for the audiovisual industry, Horizon Europe also to facilitate the innovation and the technical transformation of the industry. And final comment on my side, the crisis is so serious that no one can do this alone. So we will really go for also for much greater synergies than we had in the past with the national and the regional administration responsible for the funds. 
the challenges are common, so the response has to be much more joined up than it has the case, been the case so far. Thank you, Lucia. Yes, absolutely. Now, Luis, um, the FA, the European Film Agency Directors Association, is the voice of national European film agencies, bringing together the directors of national film funds from European countries. So taking into account the European recovery plan, what is the position of the FAD related to the execution of this plan? What, what are the opportunities that the next generation EU could offer to contribute to the transformation of the European audiovisual industry? I'll let you present uh, your point of view, Luis. Well, uh, me voy a presentar primero en, en castellano, si me permite. Um, I will speak in Spanish first. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and it is really a great organization from the San Sebastian um, Film Festival part. For your question, well, just just before addressing your your question, um, let me just underline a little bit what was the role, the main role that national film funds had during this crisis since the very early stage of the pandemic. Um, even it is never enough, the consensus about the vital role played by film funds, and I'm sure that without them, the European or the visual industry would have been in a more dramatically impacted. And for those uh, who, who are not um, concerned with, those, uh, with the kind of uh, measures that were taken by, by the film funds, uh, let me present you some examples. Um, we all started, like, like Lucia has done, by <clears throat> adjusting the, the schemes that we have. So we prepared rescue plans and recovery plans. We created insurance and compensation guarantee funds that were launched or implemented. Um, and the diversity of measures and intents of exchange uh, of best practices between members were vital in this stage. Not only film funds, adjusted the regulations and we learned from each other. Uh, we managed to pay in advance. We launched new support schemes. We relaxed some requirements, some of them quite bureaucratic that didn't make any kind of sense in the times that we were living. But also some of uh, us have managed to uh, negotiate with the central government new emergency or recovery funds that were vital to keeping our, our energy with enough strength to overcome this crisis. Uh, also, we had uh, launched a series of initiatives to make sure that works that were not allowed to be seen in, in cinema screenings were allowed to be launched during the lockdown on, uh, were accessible online. That was also vital to keep the creative work done in Europe accessible to the public and make it valuable and make it our voice the listen and our, our works to be shown. Uh, so film and audiovisual funds uh, continue to be uh, fully engaged and company this, the, 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 the sector in the recovery. We are facilitating the resuming of shootings, solve, trying to solve the insurance gap that is not quite uh, achieved yet, but we are hoping that we will. I will come back to that, to that a little bit later. Bringing back for the audience to reopen theaters and finding additional resources to continue to reinforce their support that is so much in need. And well, for those who are, who are curious to see how are we um, following through this, these measures, I would invite you to go through our website where you can find all the measures that are taken by each, each film fund uh, in Europe. Now addressing directly your question. So <clears throat> at European level, we think we need uh, actions in two main areas, both in funding and on regulation. The funding area. We follow very closely the EU recovery package, uh, and it's an historical plan that is very welcomed by all of us and this, uh, the so-called next generation EU measures. We are very grateful to the European Parliament that, uh, as formally asked last week, uh, the resolution on the cultural recovery to earmark the budget for cultural and creative sectors, asking 2% for cultural and creative sectors in the recovery of the resilience facility. We are eager to understand a little bit more uh, how precisely this EU money will be distributed in practice to the audiovisual sector via the member states and the regional authorities. In fact, we are not as much used to, to utilize this kind of, of funds 
So we will need a little bit more guidance in order to, uh, to grab this opportunity. Um, because our, our companies, our divisional companies are not as, as, as used to use these structural and regional funds. So more clarity and guidance will be very welcome. And uh, how can we, uh, all these sectors will benefit from other EU programs like Digital Europe, Horizon Europe, etc. There is a need for a space at European Commission that exploits synergies between different programs and helps the actors of the sector to be better understand the opportunities they offer. Also, very important, and just uh, blinking my eye to see you here, uh, an ambitious media program is a must for us. Uh, we want, if preferable, double the budget, continued support for independent productions, a greater support for the promotion of European works online and in cinema, avoid delays in launch of calls in 2021. Please, that's, that's, that's a requirement that everybody has. And um, let me just introduce one of, uh, also one of our priority concerns that theaters, the resuming of European co-productions, the need to guarantee the insurance to European co-productions. Uh, although insurance guarantee funds or compensation funds have been launched in already in several uh, member states, seven I think right now, so it's Austria, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, UK, uh, Germany, and soon to be Ireland. These instruments are mainly for national productions shot in the respective countries. This represents a huge problem for uh, European co-productions. We have been relentlessly calling on the European Commission to set up a European insurance guarantee fund for European co-productions. Uh, so far, we didn't manage to, to, to find any, any proper solution, but I'm sure that we will achieve something in this area because it's vital to keep our co-productions going. Now on the regulatory area. So uh, what, we, we are, what we are aiming right now, uh, well, we would need to make sure that the US streamers, internet players and video sharing platforms that benefited a lot as we saw uh, in, in the previous presentation, uh, a lot from the crisis will fairly contribute to the financing and promotion of European creation. This is vital for us. Also, we call for a quick and ambitious implement, implementation of AVMSD and Copyrights Directive with the ob objective to support the European independent production, uh, a better promotion of European works online and a fair remuneration of authors. That's crucial for us. Also, in order to uh, properly guarantee uh, the appliance of the directive, it's vital for us to ensure the transparency of data consumption by online services. We urgently need to be established by Europe on an European level. Online streamers should be obliged to be more transparent and share viewing figures with right holders and public authorities, such as regulators of film funds. Uh, we would like to have also an ambitious agenda to fight piracy. It's vital to have uh, uh, an agenda on this issue um, and to, to, to guarantee that the legal audiovisual uh, legal uh, audiovisual offer is, is secure. Um, we, will, we will ask also the, the European authorities to keep the exclusion of audiovisual, audiovisual services, regardless of the transmission, transmission mode, out of the scope of trade negotiations. That is vital for us. It was a long struggle we had in the last year, and I, I think it will be vital for the next couple of years. So finally, um, the need for a continuous dialogue with the EU institutions and the Commission in particular, we have a lots of things to change, lots of things to get better. Uh, we are eager to keep our work uh, with, uh, with, directly with, with the European institutions, especially with Lucia, and I'm sure that all this common effort will be a huge help for the sector that this is too much impacted by this crisis. So, so far, it's our views for this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for uh, this uh, quite a quite a requests list. I would say so. What is necessary to to happen to go on? And um, now I go back to Germany and uh, uh, Peter. I'm very interested to to hear you speak now about the German stimulus and recovery plan for the audiovisual sector. What um, extraordinary measures are being considered and implemented to rebuild the um, 
the industrial fabri fabric uh, of the sector and uh, speed up possible reforms to, to transform the German audiovisual industry. Tell us more um, from uh, Berlin, I guess, right? Yeah, right. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, I don't know uh, if there are special German measures uh, and uh, the invention of the real. Uh, it's just like any other countries in the world, the crisis took Germany by surprise and uh, authorities had to react quickly and make important decisions at once without any hesitations and without any hands-on experiences or guidelines. This was a very difficult situation and in the first step we did what everybody else did in Europe or worldwide. There were emergency measures, the shutdown measures I call them, Directly after the shutdown, we just helped with uh, interrupted and cancelled production. We gave compensation to producers, but also to distributors because they stopped immediately to uh, distribute their films and nobody exactly knew what to do. And so there was um, immediate help necessary. And uh, you have to know funding institutions are not designed for emergency measures. They are designed for um, middle-term and long-term uh, building up a structure and industry or creative industry structures, but not for emergency cases like this. And so we had to get more flexible. We had to think over administration. We had to be creative in administration. Yes, this exists. And uh, this was the challenge, not only in Germany and I think all over the place, all over Europe and also in the Commission. So we had to find solution and that's what we did. And there was a bunch of measures um, which was accompanying the shutdown, trying to soften the immediate effects of the shutdown. At the second stage now, we try to reboot, to restart uh, the industry. And there's a big program since June out. Uh, it's a so-called restart program for the cultural infrastructure in Germany, 165 million euros have been put on the table by the government, tax money, and uh, this tax money is necessary in order to reboot the industry. And this is not FFA money because levy systems like us, like the CNC and many other institutions in Europe, like and in many other funding institutions in Europe are based on levies. And levies depend on income, for instance, of cinema and the theaters. And if there are no levies, if there is a shutdown, if uh, cinemas are closed, then we do not have any income. And this makes more than one third of our income, which is lacking. And so we are also uh, yeah, in a crisis. And uh, I'm very happy and grateful that the government with, with tax money was intervening at this time. And those 165 million euros contain also a 50 million euro guarantee fund which is just the beginning because there are also the region and the federal state Germany, which will come into the guarantee fund. And I hope that this guarantee fund will increase to 100 billion euros, but there are still problems because, you know, a guarantee fund is something you normally create in a year and we had to create it in weeks and months. And uh, this is really the fast track and we have to speak with other countries. We have to find harmonization. And uh, just Luis Chavivas already mentioned it. Um, yes, the subject is co-productions. What do we do with the co-production, which is shut in France, but uh, the COVID-19 case happens in Germany? It's a co-production. So um, do we limit uh, our guarantee fund only to German production, to German majority production? Uh, how do we harmonize? this network of guarantee funds within Europe so that co-productions are still possible. This is a big challenge. And a further big challenge in Germany is how do we break this chicken and egg problem at the time being? The chicken and egg problem is there are no great films available. There are no Hollywood blockbusters coming into Germany, coming to Europe, filling the theaters. And because there are no big films available right now for the theaters, they do not even open. So 50% of the theaters in Germany are open. And this was social distancing, meaning they run German cinema right now, the exhibitors with 20% of their capacity. And social distancing without films, meaning 
that they make this year more than 350 million euros losses. And with every week, with every month, you have to fear that there will be severe structural damages in the exhibition sector. And we are really afraid that we might lose parts of our exhibition, uh, exhibitors and parts of our cinemas. And that's what we are right now fighting for by investing in distribution, by investing in promotion, by guiding the audience back into the theaters and to bring more money into the theaters that there are courages and reopen the cinemas in order to welcome the audience. And this is the chicken and egg problem we have to handle right now. But I'm quite optimistic if we look at the results for, of one film, Tenet, Christopher Nolan. Yes, just was, uh, had its theatrical release all over Europe. And it was very successful right now in Germany and in France and in many other neighboring countries. And this shows that film, people is still interested in cinema, in European cinema, in German cinema. And if you look, for instance, at the situation of drive-in theaters, we have 20 times more drive-in theaters since March. With uh, extreme figures, they are rising to, to 1,500% more, more audiences right now, because you have to, have to take your car in order to go to a movie. And that's what they do, what people do, what the audience does. And this, I think, is a very, very good sign that people does not fear only the infection, but they are still willing to go in a theater to see European cinema. And this, um, I think, is a very good sign for the time after the crisis. And so it's a survival question right now in, in Germany that we um, take care of the cinemas right now, of the exhibitors, of the theaters. And this is our major concern. And after the crisis, there will be an evaluation. You will have a look at the structure, but let's wait and waiting is hard in those times. But after a clear analysis, after a diagnosis, uh, it's not possible to plan your measures for the future. And that's what we, what we have to wait for, the end of the crisis. I think everybody is uh, dreaming of the end of the crisis at any case. I see we go back to the future with a car in the 50s and drive-ins now, but uh, cinema not dead, as I understand. So that's good. So let's move forward and see uh, what happens um, uh, with uh, Iole Maria, um, um, to, to what's happening in Italy. Which measures aimed at the audiovisual sector are going to be presented to Brussels in the National Reform Plan? And how is Italy actually going to face the transformation of its industrial fabric, as I was talking uh, uh, before, and what are the key elements that uh, you think have to be considered? Um, um, Yole, Maria, please um, go on. It's, uh, it's your turn to tell us more. Thank you, Elise. It's my pleasure to be here with you and share this, our views on how we try and tackle this incredible hit that we have with COVID that affected the whole industry. And I have to say, we were, as uh, the National Film Fund, we were under a lot of pressure and because we wanted to be helpful to our companies to help them survive through the crisis. And in order to do so, we had, let's say, three main strategies. First of all, we it was crucial that we just streamline the actual measures we have in place that are often you know blocked by other situations by uh, bureaucracy and we had the tools now to make it easier and to unlock funding that were already there um, and to accelerate let's say speed up our procedures relaxing also some of our rules um, on the second on a second level we implemented extraordinary measures and i will go back to this in a minute but there was a third, I think, crucial um, action we had to take that was a regulatory one, so not an economic one, but that was very important in this case, which was rethinking um, what qualifies as a film for us, because of course, to qualify as a film, you need to be released in theaters and that wasn't possible. Now, this seems a very basic question, but in the end, 
as I have to say, uh, Gilles Fontaine very well presented to us at the beginning, in the end, what happened with this crisis is that it just accelerated questions and trends that were already there. And we were already um, re reflecting on the difference between a, a project, a, a work, that it's a film and it's not in order to give it the uh, specific categories of support. This became a main uh, of, of a main import, of importance now, and we only took obviously a temporary measure for the moment, which means that during the period of the um, shutdown of theaters, and actually for a little longer than that, because we know that yes, by law theaters can be reopened, but that that wasn't immediately the case. We reopened mid June, and it took a while, and we're is, is still not full capacity, obviously. Um, so we've extended this period in which films that are, were actually released on other platforms could still benefit from the support they, get, they got from us as films and will have support in the future in these terms. But of course, now this derogation is, is um, at this deadline, but the question is still there because of course, you shut down people on uh, there in their houses for months they will change their their consumption habits and how will this then change again or is this an opportunity what we should we think about that to tell you the truth and this i'm really um sharing with you a personal experience i also consider that Somehow, yes, it is true, once a habit is set in, it's, it's settled in, it's difficult to change. But it's also true that I think people are so eager to enjoy a different experience of just watching audiovisual content sitting in their sofa in their small houses that they really <laughs> can't stand anymore. And I have to say, personally, um, I was back in the theaters during Venice Film Festival, which was a miracle in itself for a festival of such level to happen with impeccable um, uh, comply to the uh, safe sanitary rules. And it was a great success and a great message to all, um, to all film festivals, I think, that were also there, by the way, represented the, all the European uh, film festival directors. And that was the first time for me to be back in a cinema theater. And I rediscovered that kind of emotion that cannot be replaced. And, and it was, you could feel that was shared by the audience there. It was not just the emotion of the wonderful films we were watching, but it's being back in, in this collective experience. It cannot be replaced by anything online, just as this, incredibly interesting and, and necessary panels we're having, but still it's not, this, it would be different if we could look at each other's eyes for real and breathe the same <laughs> breath we can know, the same air we cannot breathe right now. Um, so this could be a chance also for cinema theaters. Of course, they were the most hit and we had special measure, measures for, for cinema theaters and, and for outdoor theaters. We had in total 42 million euros just for them to cover the losses they had. And then we had exceptional measures in our regular um, uh, um, support lines, like with the tax credit, with a 10% um, rate, uh, additional rate, particularly to cover the additional expenditure needed to, to respect the safety protocols, uh, as well as we didn't put up an insurance fund. Uh, we, what we said is that we were not going to um, cancel the contribution, whatever they were, if the film is, as we hope we won't happen, but if the film is interrupted uh, irreversibly, the, our contribution will stay on and we won't need the final copy of the film to, to authorize it. In this structure, since these questions were already there, and since actually we have a new film law that was only um, uh, implemented three years ago, um, what we're also somehow going to propose to, to, do, to the EU, which we're very thankful for the great great support it, it has given to Italy. Uh, uh, the biggest chunk of funding is going to Italy and we're very grateful for that. It, it would be to re reinforce 
um, those um, system that was already implemented and particularly implementing all the measures that are making our system more sustainable uh, to, in thinking of green economy and digital economy to support the infrastructure, to make our infrastructure even better. Just think of our studios, which are renowned worldwide, also because of the craftsmanship that, that comes along with them. Of course, they need to be modernized as much as possible and be available for, uh, for, inter in, for all international productions that may come. Uh, to. Mm -hmm. So it's an overall plan. I won't go into the details because we're drafting it right now. Uh, but I think it's a great opportunity to rethink the, the system, the, starting from what were the problems already before the COVID crisis. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Yole. Um, in case you want to ask questions, please use uh, uh, the chat and uh, uh, the application Slido is giving us the question directly here in the virtual studios all over the places and uh, we can uh, ask them to the uh, speaker. We have unfortunately very few time, but I would actually love to ask uh, maybe one or two questions uh, because I have no the privilege to be there and directly tiempo, connected to you. Sí um, I understand that uh, everybody of you is saying like, well, actually it is accelerating something which was bueno, actually already there respecto, and the problems which were problems actually became bigger suddenly and uh, there are some things we, we had to, 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 to jump in and to, to do some recovery uh, um, um, uh, emergency programs, and this I understand perfectly, but, um, do you think that what, which priorities do you see that have changed most when you see the programs before, where there was already something uh, encouraging the transformation, and when you see what's happening today, what has changed the most in the priority? Is it only the, 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 the money? We talked a, lot, a little bit also about the regulatory uh, uh, things, but what, what, where do you see the priorities have changed the most in the, the program? Who would like to take the question first? Anyone? You have to unmute yourself, uh, Lucia. I will break the eyes. Yes. I, I think there is a sense of urgency that was not there before. We're speaking, we need to change, we need to change, but mañana. And now I think change is yesterday. So there is really a sense of urgency that we need collectively to address and work together in the transformation of the industry and, and really address the digital and the green transformation. But I think addressing the digital transformation of the industry is of the essence. The use of data, connecting with audiences in a different way, how to make even cinema theaters the experience more immersive thanks to technologies. Uh, so, because we need, tend to think that when we speak about digital, it's just about distribution, online distribution modes, and it's not the case. It's to make this digital transformation, transformation which is pervasive across the whole players of the value chain. Absolutely. So there, there, I see this completely, the digital transformation with certain priorities have accelerated, but it's going there where we thought it would go anyway. Um, you were evoking sustainability, if I understood uh, right, through all yeah. the translation and etc. Yeah. So um, what are, do you think, the um, uh, sustainability criteria that uh, uh, projects should actually meet in order maybe to receive funding? Do you think it's going to change a lot also in the next uh, months coming up or years coming up, the very next years? What, what I can announce is that with the media program, we are going to be very serious about sustainability. We plan to start with incentives. Uh, we will do it gradually in order not to disrupt uh, things. But certainly at the same time, we are taking this very seriously. And for the actions that really receive uh, more money from media already as of next year, we would like to introduce some incentives uh, to really go green. We see potential for training as well, because I think there is really a need to, to in some cases, to educate the professionals. But um, this is something that, uh, at least with the media program, is going to happen. Mm. 
absolutely no i see this also that there, there is the, the, the need for this has been uh, completely seen and uh, there is this very nice initiative uh, uh, reunificating everything you know this rural cinema with people going uh, mm -hmm. outdoors uh, in europe very nice uh, example of collaboration with being outside taking care of the communities and collectivities beyond green cinema integrating also the social aspects of that i think that, that we have uh, fantastic examples also in in, in europe Europe. Um, maybe um, does anyone um, does anyone want to add something on sustainability or the technological advancement and the measures that you see being more priority than others? Peter, could you understand my question this time? Yes, please. Yes, um, um, maybe uh, one remark. I think uh, Germany has been one of several front runners concerning sustainability. And uh, this is a high priority project for us in Germany. But one remark, um, when we come out of the crisis and maybe we see a little bit light at the end of the tunnel, although uh, infection rates are increasing right now everywhere, also in Germany, um, then we have a weak industry. We have producers which have to get back on their feet again. And, you know, um, then to put on them uh, besides uh, sanitary rules and uh, hygienic conditions, uh, even the green certificate and maybe social minimum standards, we should not, uh, you know, exaggerate and give them time, one step after the other. First of all, we have to analyze uh, the damage. First of all, we have, we have to help them to uh, regain their business, to restart their business, and then uh, one step after the other concerning sustainability. This is a little bit uh, my worry uh, as one of the countries which uh, is really severe in this point, and we are at the starting point right now, just before uh, COVID-19 uh, mm. crisis, we were at the starting point to launch our green certificate for German producers uh, and uh, our carbon uh, calculator and we were discussing social minimum standards, but mm -hmm. at the time being, we have to be careful not yeah. to exaggerate the measures to put in, to be put in place. Yeah, absolutely. I know we, we are running out of time, but I would love to give uh, Luis the opportunity to add something on this. No, just, just following what uh, Peter said, well, well actually uh, on the industry level, we are uh, right now starting to try to learn how to shoot clean and safe and I'm sure that we're going to try to manage that with sustain sustainability policies. But as Peter said, we have to balance a little bit those because we have a challenge ahead. We have a, a very fragile uh, ecosystem right now that is very transversal. It's, it's all over, even on, on, on traditional players that were very strong and right now they're struggling to, to, to survive. So um, I would yeah. recommend obviously to keep it, keep it up but on, on, on and adjust it. Uh, to yeah. these new times so thank you so i see that my question uh, about the priorities uh, was uh, right into the target where is going where are we going but um i have unfortunately i have to close the panel for now because i have the next panel coming up thank you so much and i see this is the, the beginning of a debate at any case and see like coming out of an emergency situation with emergency measures for sure and a clean Re, uh, recover and then step by step as you were saying thank you very much to my panelists and now we're going to move on and go to the second panel towards the transformation of the european industry uh, because after covid19 the crisis in the production distribution structures of independent cinema is probably here well well first of all we are not out of the crisis it's going to stay a little bit if we like it or not. So we want to explore in this panel what scenarios will the uh, European independent uh, production operate after the pandemic, or what new funding and distribution model can be consolidated from now on. Will this crisis be used to standardize more sustainable practices in line with the green shooting movement? Um, and what new opportunities may emerge after the increase of the consumption of um, audiovisual content online. And for this, I have uh, three panelists. I think I have an all-male panel right here. 
<laughs> so we will have uh, Alvaro Longoria, um, <laughs> hey, the vice president of the European Producers Club, producer and partner of Morena Films in Spain. Uh, we have uh, Francois Ayon, um, who is the lucky one being in San Sebastian. He has a fantastic view behind him. Yes, I know. We don't want to see this. Francois. Francois is partner, sales and business development manager for the Playtime Group in France, which includes the Films Constellation in the UK, Films Boutique in Germany, and B4 Films in Belgium. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Alex martinez the uh, head of content at Movistar in um, uh, Spain. Do I say Movistar Plus uh, uh, in Spain, right? Well, we're, we're, we're at it. We can add a couple of pluses here. Wonderful. So um, I think I will start with you, uh, um, Alvaro, right? I mean, uh, let's uh, start with this. You are, uh, I mean, the, the European Producers Club was one of the first associations to suggest to the institutions compensatory measures to alleviate the direct consequences of the stencil caused by the lockdown due to COVID. Um, however, the accelerated rate of the changes forces us to think uh, beyond the present. So content will be still king for sure, but um, how will the independent producers be able to finance their film and what role will, will public funds um, uh, play in uh, the new scenario? I, I leave you a couple of minutes to uh, expose uh, your um, hypothesis here, right? Thank you very much, uh, AC. I think uh, I want to thank the panel uh, because it has uh, first to Jose Luis Rebordinos of San Sebastián, of whom I am a great fan and Lucia and all of you for organizing this panel, because first of all, it has forced us to put our heads together at the European Producers Club and come up with uh, a number of measures that we're gonna present now. Uh, it's very difficult, as you all know, to put together people from 28 countries. We are 130 producers uh, at the EPC, but we somewhat manage <laughs> to, to agree, which is something that is uh, quite surprising. So and Alvaro, would... you presented for the first time here today. Yes, yes, yes. It's a this is world fantastic. premiere. World premiere. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Now we are talking. Yes. So I, I actually, we have prepared a little presentation that I think we can go through very quickly. I'll try to be very brief. I know we are short on time. If it's a uh, premiere, we'll go through. Let's go. So I think, first of all, I, everybody has agreed that we have, uh, we're living a fundamental transformation. And I think that this transformation essentially has created a crisis uh, at the European audiovisual uh, market that also presents some opportunities. But we at the European Producers Club believe that the European authorities and the European uh, Commission has to take the lead in order to uh, come up with some uh, measures to try to balance this disequilibrium that is created now because otherwise there will be a lot of casualties in the process. Uh, we believe that these measures that we are going to present now have to uh, uh, search the keeping of the essence of the European uh, Union, which is preserving diversity and entrepreneurship. We believe that at this uh, crucial point, as I said, the European Union has uh, has to take the, the, the lead, and I think it's, uh, it's important that it takes uh, the lead uh, because uh, as, as uh, Beatriz and others have mentioned, specific countries are negotiating at the moment specific measures, but I think this is a great opportunity also for Europe to, to demonstrate that together you can uh, be better and stronger. So um, we believe uh, in the creation of European champions. There's been a lot of discussion about whether the future uh, lies within the champions, and we support that. Uh, both uh, creation of uh, bigger networks, uh, new platforms, uh, great production companies, but we also believe that the greatest champion is a great product, especially from the producer's point of view. So we think for independent small producers that sometimes feel like David against Goliath, no? when you go and negotiate with a platform, the best way, the best weapon is to have a great, uh, a great product, a great script or a great uh, series that you can negotiate with. And in order to do that, some measures are required. So I think we can go now to uh, slide two, where we have the first two measures. One has already been uh, discussed, but we, uh, which is the uh, inc increase of the obligation to all uh, platforms and all uh, uh, broadcasters in Europe. So everybody competes on the same way. And also try to force the for mostly foreign owned uh, OTT platforms to invest 
heavily in European content. So we at the EPC are calling for an investment obligation through AVMS or another vehicle of 25% of the turnover of the OTT services into European works of which 80% should be reserved for independent production companies and at least 50% dedicated to local content produced by independent producers. I think this is crucial in order to keep diversity because otherwise we may only end up doing product in the big countries. No, I think it's important to keep the European diversity. This we should, we should keep within the independent uh, production company in, uh, in uh, production companies in order to protect the European ecosystem that is very fragile because very atomized. The second uh, measure that we're calling for is the implementation of, some, of a best practices charter between independent producers and OTT services. It is sometimes very complicated for a small production company to negotiate with as again these goliaths that you know have a different way of working because they come from a different market where things were made in a different way so we believe that the independent producers have to be empowered in order to retain some of the ownership of the rights that they have created they should be uh, fairly remunerated they should have some share of the revenues in case that the show or film is a success they should have their creative role protected and respected somehow. We believe that producers are also authors. And we would like to uh, ask for some transparency of the data, because right now we don't know what, uh, a lot of the times we don't really know what is, uh, what is happening, how the, the programs or the shows are, 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 are performing. And I think that, uh, that we would like that to change, and I think it would be fair. In the next slide, we can go to a more um, public money. I don't believe that public funding should be the basis of anything in this world. <laughs> I believe that the private uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit has to be uh, the driving force between production companies, and that's what we are. We are entrepreneurs and creators. But here, at this point, we think that there is a very big role that the authorities can take, and they have to take, otherwise uh, the ecosystem would fall apart. And then it, once this falls apart, it's very difficult to put it back together. So we are calling for the, uh, for the creation of a European Union funded uh, project development fund. I, as I said before, um, nothing gives uh, more power to a producer than to have a great project. And if you are able to, to develop great uh, intellectual property with great talent and with a great uh, cast, and, and, and take it forward as far as you can, then you, you are in a much better uh, negotiating position. And for that, uh, we believe that, the, that the, the creation of a fund could be really useful. Um, the second uh, public funding demand is for the creation of a European co-production fund to foster European film and TV series co-productions within the independent model. Uh, what I mean by this is that the, the appearance of new broadcasters has uh, led to a lot of uh, co-productions being only financially driven. That means that you co-produce with a country because you can spend some money here and get a tax rebate here or a subsidy there. But the spirit of the content is lost. We should push for co-productions that have a, a European uh, spirit, a European content that are great and that they're co-productions because they're good products, not because they're shot half here and half there. And, uh, and this will allow for the European uh, co-productions to thrive again, because I think now it's, been, it's become more of a financial model. And by creating a, a fund that promotes that, we think we can, we can re re regenerate the, the co-production model, which was based on, on an old system of local funding. Uh, also, I think we propose for the relaxation of the 60% intensity aid limit, which exists at the moment, which prevents films or, or TV series to be uh, funded publicly more, by more than 60%. It would probably be a temporary measure until the, the industry comes back to an equilibrium. But for now, I think this is limiting uh, more than helping. We understand the spirit of, will, of, will, of this measure, <clears throat> measure, but we feel at this point 
in this crisis it could be uh, alleviated. Uh, and then on the final slide, we have two more measures that are more, one is very idealistic and the other is very specific. So we go from the bigger to the smaller, from the dream to the practice. First is to look for ways in which you can break the, the oligopoly. O oligopoly is bad for competition. If you only have five players and you're a very small supplier, like most European producers are, you're in a bad shape because you depend on these five people to distribute your product. So we would uh, call for the invention or, or, or to creation of a think tank to create alternatives for worldwide distribution for European independent product, using the new technologies that are in existence and, uh, and finding routes that people can access you know, to get their products in and maybe financing it in a different way, but not only depending on the bigger, if you want to do a European wide product or an international product, only independent on the, on the OTTs. No? Uh, and also we call for a very specific, and this one, as I say, is a dream, no? it's more of a vision. How can we break this? We don't know maybe today, but I'm sure in five years there'll be many different channels as five years ago. Every, who would have said we would be here today discussing about, uh, you know, Netflix, no one. Amazon, <laughs> COVID, YouTube, all these things, no? <laughs> Absolutely no one, Alvaro, I would say, right? Yeah, it's complicated, but you never know. Uh, and I think you have to be uh, thinking of, a, a, be, be a bit uh, optimistic and, uh, and, uh, and dreamy uh, mm -hmm. to think about alternatives, because if we stick to what it is today, maybe it's not so, so great. No? So the final measure is a very specific one that is... Um, preventing a lot of uh, shootings, and I finish with this, is the creation of a European-wide guarantee fund for insurance of COVID. Some countries have put it, Netherlands, uh, France, Germany, fantastic, no? But some other countries don't have that. So I think by the European Union, by taking the lead and presenting a, a world, uh, a European-wide uh, mm -hmm. system, it would be allowed for the smaller companies also to continue shooting. That's Absolutely. it for me. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'm so sorry. I would love to have a little bit more time, but we are pressed by time. And I would love to give also the opportunity to your uh, co-panelists to maybe react to this or maybe also <laughs> answer my further questions. Uh, uh, maybe I'll start with um, uh, Francois. Um, Francois, first of all, would you like to react to what uh, Alvaro just presented? Otherwise, I have a question for you right away. Let's, let's go to the question. Let's go straight to the question. This is wonderful. Okay, anyway, um, the film distribution in cinemas, re, we, we heard, uh, need to be reinvented in view of the increase of the consumption of cinema online, especially by young people. The growing trend among sales agents is to diversify the business by taking part in the production of projects right from the development phase and using their sales channels for their international distribution, which includes a streaming platform for films that are more complicated than to distribute in cinemas. Is it so? And what new formulas do you see are you considering to diversify the business and ensure your group's funding? What is your strategy there? Um, thank you, AC, for having me on this panel, and thank you, José Luis uh, Rebordinos and the San Sebastian Film Festival for holding the event. Uh, San Sebastian uh, Festival is the proof that you can still hold, like Venice, a COVID um, event or an event, a great event in times of COVID. Um, it's a bit different, but it exists and it gives a lot of energy, I think, around. So a big uh, thank to the Basque Country and to José Luis. Now to come back on... Um, a lot has been said on the panel uh, by very good speakers. I was particularly impressed by what Gilles Fontaine exposed in terms of numbers, um, because it's always good to see aggregates of numbers when you, on the market, feel the trend. And of course, what Gilles has shown um, is um, very powerful, uh, because it really shows the drop. Um, I can only speak from an entrepreneur point of view. Um, I don't have a plan, and I will not risk to make forecasts I think the first thing that um, this crisis is teaching us is to be humble about forecasting. Um, but I can tell you, as an entrepreneur, and I feel that um, I'm sure a lot of companies in Europe feel the way we feel, is that first of all, we felt um, helped, supported, um, whether it's through um, guaranteed loans, whether it's through the actions um, of um, the bank that is uh, the French bank that is in our capital, whether it's through regional helps, 
Um, I, I think every entrepreneur of any small business in Europe felt that he was not, neither in China, not in the US. He felt supported. And that's a very important thing. And um, you know, professionals, uh, professional organizations such as uh, what Alvaro is doing, um, and and uh, state organizations and government organizations have been extremely good at putting forward um, ideas and plans. The reality is we're not so bad because there's been such an influx of cash um, from various places that um, the problem we're facing now is not a it's not a cash issue. It's not a money issue yet. Um, the, the, what we're facing is more of a model issue, a business model issue. Um, of course, we anticipated um, the trends that have been accelerated by the COVID. As entrepreneurs, we're always uh, being very careful about what the trends are and how we can structurally adapt to them. Um, of course, we didn't expect COVID, but I think we understood quite rapidly, like most of us in the industry, I would say by June or July, that once this is over, we will be one floor below. And you can put it in any, you can say in any case, you can say, I believe, I hope, and you know, there are encouraging signs, but we know down the line that we're going to be in the floor below and that in, in certain areas and, uh, and the floor above in other areas. And we're trying to understand what those structural changes have been and how we can respond to it um, when, you, uh, when you head up, um, you know, a number of companies. So the first structural change that we uh, noticed is that there is more and more similarity between broadcasting or what content that broadcaster, broadcasters like and content that streamers like. Um, it's a pace of narration, it can be production value, it can be casting, but we, and, and, and then the question is, it's going away from what, you know, what is cinema? And nobody has answered yet the question, what is cinema, by the way? Uh, is it defined by the release in theater? Is it defined by the status of the director? Is it, <laughs> is it defined by the budget? Uh, we haven't yet totally answered that question. Um, the other um, structural changes that we're noticing is that we're going to have to expect a, um, a decrease in, um, in revenues um, coming from theatrical. And that, of course, creates a double worry for us. Uh, the first worry is how do our clients, how do our distributors um, are going to survive this space? Because you can put it in any form you want. A distributor is someone who markets a movie locally and creates the value by the theatrical and then derives the value on other media. If that chain is broken, how are our clients going to survive? The second worry we have, and we're seeing that now, um, we haven't noticed a decrease in the number of projects that were uh, presented to us. Films are being made, written, and they're going into financing. What we're afraid now is that there's a whole range of films that will not find market money anymore. Distribution money, MGs from sales agents. That money is not going to be is not going to be there in the financing plan. And and I think uh, the European uh, you know Commission and, and and governments would be wise to think that the recovery plan might um, include. Um, to go beyond the subsidy limit in order to support those films. But companies like us can, can no longer do R&D with small films. We know it has become a non-viable economic um, activity. So as a group, we um, have tried to sort of give a, an answer to the structural changes. Um, those answers are, um, first, that we continue doing what we do, which is uh, expose the greatest talents um, in cinema um, worldwide. And whether it's a festival strategy, it's a theatrical distribution strategy, it's a streamer strategy, we don't really care. What we know is those talents can go out there and there are clients um, to buy their work and, and that we're going to continue on doing. The second thing is that we believe that the, world, the work of a sales agent is has evolved, as you mentioned in your question, that we will do less and less sales, but we will be more and more used as enabler of projects. And what, what is you know, being an enabler of a project? An enabler of a project in a global economy is, for us, is um, putting in motion um, our global network, whether it is um, 
streamers, uh, US distributors, funds, co-producers, uh, whatever is in our, in our global network to put that in motion in order for the project to get a better chance to be made. And we also realized that the earlier on we are, the better the chances of success. Um, the third thing we're doing is that we are, of course, developing our own production um, because we have a very good idea of the financing structures and what the market demands. And um, as we're doing less and less sales, we're moving towards more a production model. And the last thing we're doing is that we are investing in production companies in order to accelerate their growth and to, um, uh, to put at their, you know, at their uh, disposition uh, you know, the network we have in order to strengthen their growth. Um, I hope that answers your question and I hope I was not too long. No, I mean, that's great. But what I like really in this panel, you, you give me facts, you give me things that are moving forward and that, that's absolutely great. That's what the audience also wants to, 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 to listen to. What are you doing? How are you fighting? How are you moving the system forward? So this is what we, we heard with Alvaro and with you now, Francois, and now I turn to Alex, at last, and I'm gonna, I, I have such a time pressure and I would love to have, can we have another hour, please? Can we call the organizers, please? Give me another hour so that we can talk a little bit further, right? So Alex, anyway, for you, I would love to have the perspectives because um, the increase of the consumption of films and series on the internet has boosted the online business, obviously, of streaming platform, and which is a strain which is speeded up by the lockdown. Um, I would like to know how has the arrival of the OTTs affected the Spanish, especially, and also the European market, especially since the beginning of the pandemic from your perspective? And, we say that content is king and Movie Star Plus offers a huge amount of plural content. And what do you see for trends coming up for the next uh, few years in terms of subjects or formats? I mean, I would love to see how you envision the future. Um, how long I have for my answer? Because <laughs> yeah. I made a lot of questions. I give you five full minutes for sure. Go on, okay. go on. Lo voy a decir en español. Okay, I will say it in... Spanish, thank you for inviting me. I I miss San Sebastian. Well, even though I'm in front of the sea because he, I am in Mallorca, I am still sad because I don't see La Concha. I want to be pragmatic. And as Francois said, the consumption of, of films in our platform has been over 22%. And we have had a 20% consumption of series. So we don't mind the channel of storytelling. The main change is that the audience decide. They decide if they want to see a story told in 25 minutes or in two hours with a huge budget. And we have to understand this. Everything is cinema, everything is film, and everything gets to the audience. When it comes to um, global platforms, of course, we had to rush and offer more things in our platform. Right now, we are in a place that we had never dream, dreamt of um, five years ago. We have offers, so the audience decide how they watch our content. The habit change has been huge, but it has helped the, the piracy, the hacking, and there's another factor and that's language, especially in Spain. Spanish language has traveled, and it is traveling right now. We have different series all over the world, and our industry was ready for this. We were creating films and series at a, uh, at a really fast pace. So we have an opportunity there, if we can see it, because we have a strong industry in Spain. And this opportunity is also relevant. 
um, from here on is uh, Brexit, and we haven't talked about it, but we will see the disappearance of the equality of this industry from Great Britain, United Kingdom. Um, and for me, there's an another key factor, the risk of cultural sovereignty. It isn't that relevant at some po different moments, but we are living a historical crisis. Maybe in some years, what we produce in, in Europe will be decided outside of Europe. And this should make us think twice about our measures that we will implement. From Movistar Plus, we, we defend our cultural sovereignty in Spain and European sovereignty as well. We always lose all auctions when it comes to rights, and that makes us less competitive. We should be able to create an, a, a European platform. In Spain, we think that we have to support the industry around our Spanish population. So we keep this culture in the country and, of course, create an attractive market for all the industries that come in Spain and produce there. This will only work if everybody that takes decisions are sitting around the same table. If every politician is sitting anywhere else, well, they will never come to an agreement. And I think that Spain, as a country, should, should work as a, as a whole so we can have a, a Spanish industry. We have accelerated different changes, different changes because of the pandemic. Well, we have to accelerate also the measures as well. We have to take the less time possible and do as much as we can. And to just to to end with a note, I wish all. I wish all of you that in 2021 we will be able to hug each other. This second wave that we are living, uh, experiencing right now, well, it will be hard. Here in Spain, we are suffering. And I hope that I will see you in San Sebastian next year. so we can work together in a concrete mar in a concrete market thank you thank you very much that's uh, that that's very good and uh no we didn't talk about the brexit i didn't have the time i'm very <laughs> sorry for that but i'm totally with you with the uh, european cultural sovereignty and the way to promote also a uh, european culture through the audiovisual media totally I'm afraid I'm limited by time. I just want to check in the audience that uh, we don't have any question that I can take on. Otherwise, I will have, unfortunately, to, to make that very short because um, I, I will have to, 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 to pack it all together. But maybe I would like to have a super short last round with uh, all, which of, each of you. I would like you to tell me where is your, we were saying in the first panel, we have to take it step by step. We were referring partly to the sustainability, but also like with what is happening with the emergency and et cetera, and et cetera. I would like to know for each of you, because of your perspective as a, as a company and um, where you come from in an association, et cetera, what is your very first next step on your action list 
to move the industry forward. And uh, who would like to take uh, the, the, this question first? Alvaro, you go. Well, I'm going to quote Winston Churchill. Uh, I am an optimist. I thought it was a better choice. You know? So I am an optimist. I have to be. Uh, and the first thing we're, we can, we continue to shoot. We are shooting now and uh, we have to evolve and adapt. Boom. That's for sure, because the audience wants content and they want more content. So that's the, the, the situation, actually. They want more, right? And we heard before from Alex that, uh, or I heard or I translated that, uh, okay, content is king, but actually the audience is king and decides uh, what they want to watch, right? Okay, Alex, you want to take uh, uh, the next step? Well, uh, we, we, we are preparing the next year, the 20 and 21st. Uh, Es un año muy difícil porque... 2021 will be a, it will be a, a, a difficult year and we will have to give a different um, offer. Dialogue, knowledge, wisdom and finding what people want will be key. So we have to keep talking in Spain we have a, a great opportunity and it should it, would, it could be translated in Euro, into Europe our um, our kitchen our food is a phenomenon and we are also really um, we are always welcoming people with open arms, we know Ferran Adria, Mr. El Señor Arzac, we have different platforms and together we have to work. Otherwise, in five years, we will be talking to, to I don't know, I don't know who, asking for money, begging for money, me, even. So now we have to stop arguing and get hands in, hands on. And uh, maybe final words for you, Francois. I mean, you gave us already quite a very pragmatic approach and saying, okay, we we show great talents, we, um, uh, we have our own productions and uh, we um, uh, move on with production companies, acquiring uh, production companies, so a more corporate level. But um, again, for you, the question, what is your very next step in terms of priority to move on so that the industry is moving on? So what, what is the first priority? The immediate priority is to make sure we acquire the right content for next year. And, uh, and to make sure that what we have acquired before, we can find great place for uh, what, we what we already have in terms of films and, uh, and, then, uh, and then move on with this. And there is very limited resources of talents that are still, you know, have the possibility of a world distribution. So it's, uh, it's always key to us and there's always a limited number of resources as well. So where we decide to invest is gonna be key this year for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think at the same time, it's Nick, very exciting moment um, and one of the key um, uh, of 2021 and it's been said before by most of the panelists is how we will handle the negotiation with the digital studios in their um, obligation to invest into local production and as we know a local production can go global so local um, local is a new global right exactly and we can uh, look at it i think with uh, you know with uh, with excitement very good, thank you very much. Now, I think it's very interesting because you were talking about finding the right content, finding also the right audiences. Lucia was uh, uh, mentioning a little bit before that technology will also help us for that. It's great to see that technology might help us uh, to find the right audience and connect with them and have a dialogue with them. Uh, but uh, of course, it is also human intuition about the um, emotion, about the, the culture and the feelings we have here uh, in Europe to be found. So we have uh, uh, both sides of the medal here. 
Um, I thank you very much, dear panelists, and believe me, I, I wish I had another hour also with you. Um, but now I would like to try maybe to find some uh, final words and put this um, a little bit all together uh, before saying uh, goodbye to everybody. So for those of you who are not there at the very beginning, we, we talked about quite a few things, but first of all, tech allowed this event so that we could meet uh, in a, a virtual place. So that's already um, uh, thank you to technology and to the tech team in the background. You don't see them. They have done this. They've been working day and night to produce this. We are all completely dispatched all around Europe these days. So thank you very much. And it uh, went very well. Um, what did we say today? Well, we said there is a strong necessity, an obvious necessity to adapt digitize, be flexible, uh, and creative. We have, so adapt, collaborate, collaborate between countries, but also have a flow in the policies at different uh, levels from Europe, uh, nations, uh, regions, but also institutions, associations, and the industry companies, we could see this in the program today because we had them all, so to speak, so that uh, the dialogue and um, the synergies uh, could come uh, uh, there. We said we had uh, the need also to integrate. Um, integrate. We did not speak so much about diversity uh, uh, today, which is uh, certainly something which has also to do with sustainability. It was a major topic by the last European Film for us at the Berlinale. This time, of course, we had to look further more in terms of reboot, recover, and look into the future after not only recovering, we heard today, but also transforming something which was already starting before and that has been accelerated and has uh, to be supported. We heard that we feel supported here in Europe, so there is no need to be um, too much in complaining, but you may have requests, and uh, two of you have been also giving a list of requests. So it's not only, though, only about funding, we heard. It is also about regulations, but also it has to do with structures. And these structures uh, have also to do with business models. So that's why the requests we heard had to do uh, uh, with funding, but also the suggestions we heard today as a premiere from the European Producers Club um, with new measures have to do also with preservation of uh, certain quotas, for example. Um, um, best practices have been evoked. Um, it has to do with production. It has to do with rights. It has to do with distribution. Um, it has to do also, we spoke about a European distribution tool uh, at two different places. And um, I evoke also the guarantee and insurance fund, um, and which is somewhere uh, in some countries to be found in other not. And I think it brings me to the thought also that I heard that many places we need to harmonize. And uh, we need to have this flow between us. And I think all the panels have shown that we have started to do that. And I want to finish maybe to a more pragmatic, uh, pragmatic note. Um, at the end, we were saying it's great talent we need to expose. So it always starts with great stories, with great content. And we need to connect those to the audiences that uh, we need. The audience maybe is king. Um, I like that very much, actually. Even if it was not said like this, it is my own interpretation here. So please take also this um, uh, summary with my own words and my own perspective. Actually, I completely forgot to present myself at the beginning. I'm AC Coppens, and I founded the agency, the catalysts uh, and we have to do with creative and innovative projects all the time that's why uh, i was invited to moderate and it was a great pleasure for me to moderate uh, uh, these uh, sessions today um, we had a back and forth between institution associations companies the industry and um, yes this is what we had i could not uh, go uh, uh, faster with uh, the the summary but now i would love to uh, invite you all for the next things uh, uh, coming up um, it's not the last format obviously here um, so um, we are all, uh, we, I think what you say, we, are, we, we I think we're all a bit lost in um, uh, space. We, we, I don't know where you all are at the end. Well, I know where Francois is for sure, but yeah, um, we were also a little bit, lost, <laughs> a little bit lost in, um, I, I hope that the Regie is showing the picture of Francois right now because he definitely is in San Sebastian. 
um, a bit lost in time. So we are Tuesday, so tomorrow, Wednesday, the 23rd at 6 p.m., we will have a live streaming with Francisco Ramos, the vice president of uh, Spanish language originals from, uh, for Netflix in Latin America. Don't miss it tomorrow at 6 p.m. CET. Thursday, the 24th at 6 p.m., we have the live streaming of, uh, with the producers, uh, producer, sorry, Ted Hope. He doesn't need another producer uh, next to him, I'd say. Um, Ted Hope, uh, fantastic. I mean, I, uh, I, I hope I will be able to watch it, actually. And then on Friday, the 25th at 10 a.m., we have Zinemaldia and Technology. And I, was a little, I, I would have loved to have more time to... Um, ask more tech-related tech uh, questions here with you today. But we will have it all on Friday with a great series of pitchings. It will have to do with advert gaming, neuromarketing, big data, blockchain, visual analysis, artificial intelligence, machine learning, interactive narratives. I mean, they will all be there. And there will be a masterclass with Mark Arts. And he's really um, uh, one of the uh, uh, most fantastic uh, sound uh, um, uh, designers or recording mixer deluxe in Spain. And he will talk about the constant evolution of sound technology. So don't miss it. It's, it's, it's going to be great. Yes. So, I, and I will see you on Friday. I'm moderating again. So come back on Friday and we will explore the future and the future of sound. Thank you very much for, uh, to everyone. I don't know if uh, the audience has a, a possibility to see all at the same time. We can wave uh, goodbye and um, have a great day, have a great week. See you in the next days and see you next year. Definitely, please, Francois, we will go on that beach and we will have a drink together and we will hug each other as Alex was saying. Thank you very much. We should finish on Francois' picture. Thank you to all of you. Bye-bye. <laughs>